All right, let's move on. Uh, this is a 57-year-old African-American female who again presented with abdominal pain. She has a history of hypertension, sleep apnea. She had a heart attack back in uh, April of 2012. Her, she's never had surgery. Medications include metoprolol. She takes an aspirin. She takes uh, drugs for her cholesterol. Her CT chest is negative, and her laboratory studies are all within normal limits. And you can see here, she's got a tumor that's basically completely inside the renal parenchyma here. And then she's got another tumor. You would think bilateral tumors are running rampant in Houston, but they're not. Uh, another tumor present here in the left kidney. So um, first, maybe, Serena, could you just make a comment about the nephrometry score and how we use that and what the value of that is in terms of communicating about the complexity of tumors? Yeah, so a nephrometry score was uh, developed actually by somebody I used to uh, work with, Rob Uzo and, and his team. So it's a way for us to uh, put a number on how difficult a, a partial nephrectomy is going to be, or, or it, basically how complex is this tumor, which is really a great advance. Because up until then, it was all description. Well, it's in deep in the kidney, or it's this big, and there was really no way for us to have an objective number that you could translate that would mean the same thing in Houston as it would in Chicago as it would in Sri Lanka. So, but now we have that, and basically it's a way of looking at tumor size, um, uh, uh, where the tumor is located in terms of how deep is, it is in the kidney. So the deeper it is, the harder it is to remove, uh, and the higher the risk of complications, for example. How close it is to the urinary collecting system, which you can't really see on these scans, uh, but maybe later if we have some scans that have an excretory view, we can show you. But for example, the right side of tumor, maybe Chris can point out with the mouse, um, it's probably contacting where the urine is collecting. And so that increases the, the, the risks of surgery a little bit. And then there's one more. Oh, and also how close it is to the, uh, um, to the hilum, which is the, if you will, the heart of the kidney, right where all the blood vessels come in. So it, if you look at those five factors, you assign a number, one to three, in terms of how difficulty, and then you, you add it up. So if a tumor has a complexity of six, uh, it's, it's not that complex. If it has a complexity of 9, 10, 11, it's really pretty complex. Karen, do you want to comment on maybe the role of ablation here? Would you consider ablating one or both of these tumors? I think that both can be done. I mean, again, you, you need to think about the size and the location. So if both of these, they look like they both measure less than uh, 4 centimeters, um, they're both on the difficult end of the spectrum, um, similar to the nephrometry score. Um, people have tried to uh, establish criteria for ablation, and the same uh, principles apply to ablation. How big is the tumor? Where is it located? How close is it to the uh, center of the kidney? Both of these would have probably high score on that nephrometry score, if you, were, if you will. But yes, they can be done. All right, Dr. Delacroix, what would, how would this patient be treated in New Orleans? Uh, she would get a uh, bilateral partial nephrectomies. Okay. Uh, Which side first? Left side first. Why? Because uh, it's easier. It's got a lower nephrometry score. Uh, should, uh, we would do a left side and we'd probably uh, attempt that robotically. Uh, and then the right side would be an open uh, partial. Okay. Dr. Chapin, how would you approach the patient? I, I agree. I mean, I, by a lot of partials, I would do the left one uh, first because it's easier. And if I know that I'm safe with the left kidney going to the right kidney, I, I don't feel as anxious about the difficulty level of the right partial. Um, I would probably do both of these open. I actually wouldn't do these robotic or laparoscopic just, just because of the bilaterality. If, if the right kidney did not have a tumor, I might attempt at the left one robotically, but that's also a matter of experience. And so the idea of choosing the easy one first, what, just help me out with that. What, what do you mean? Why? Nothing scientifically based. Uh, <laughs> that's, again, it goes back to uh, surgeon preference. Um, the, I, I, can't, I can't point well, to I think it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's convention to some degree in the sense that the issue is preserving kidney. And so if you do the easy, easy side, meaning there's confidence that you can preserve the kidney, then you're not putting yourself behind the eight ball when you go to the other side. And if you think there's a higher risk of remo having to remove that kidney, you know you've got money in the bank with the other side. That's sort of, it, it's a philosophical thing. It's not scientific, really. Um, but it, it, that's, that's kind of what it is. It's really setting, I'm talking, saying yourself, but I mean the patient, of course. 
but trying to set the patient up for success in terms of kidney preservation. How long between operations? Well, I mean, I think that's also a point to be made of the complexity in which one you're choosing first. If, if you were to do the right one first and if you were to have a prolonged urine leak or if you really wanted to be clear of the one side being complete before doing the opposite side, I think your time between uh, surgeries would be lower if you do the easier or less complex uh, kidney first. So therefore, if you don't have a prolonged drain and, and prolonged urine leak and issues that, that can come with doing a partial, it's more complex. So if, you know, if I were to do the left one first and the patient is a 57-year-old, could pr relatively recover quickly, I, I would probably schedule the right side within four to six weeks. Okay. Well, of course, Dr. Chapin, we know you never have complications, so that would work out. Um, Dr. Um, Arar. Would you ablate both at the same time, or would you stage them? And if so, how would you stage them, and what's the time frame? No, we would stage them. We have, we have treated occasionally bilateral tumors, but uh, if they're very small and they're very easy to access, we do treat these patients under general anesthesia. It helps the procedure. The procedure can be long, two to three hours, can be painful during the procedure. Although other centers across the country use uh, moderate sedation without the use of general anesthesia, but I personally would not recommend it. Um, I would stage it, and it really doesn't matter, um, either one. Okay. <clears throat> so the uh, patient uh, unfortunately went to an outside hospital and uh, was counseled to undergo robotic-assisted laparoscopic left partial nephrectomy, the quote-unquote easy side, followed by an attempted robotic partial on the right. The surgeon apparently found the left tumor to be, quote, more complex, end quote, at surgery, and that actually turned out to be a nine-hour case. The pathology came back as unclassified renal cell carcinoma, Furman grade three. All margins were positive. Basically, they just chopped this thing out, and all the margins were positive. So, and just for the audience, margins means we look to see where we cut to be sure that there's normal tissue there, because that implies that the entire tumor was removed. But if, where we look, if we look where we cut and we see cancer, the implication is that cancer is still left behind. So in this particular patient, all the margins were positive, implying that there could still be cancer cells left behind. So her, her surgeon, after this nine-hour case, said, eh, maybe we'll just watch that right side for a while. <laughs> Dr. Delacroix, do you agree with that? What would you counsel this patient? Um, a second opinion would be good. Uh, <laughs> And, 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 and another thing, a, a nine-hour robotic procedure, I mean, there's a point where principles of oncology need to preempt the way in which a procedure is done. If it's a nine-hour case, you really need to be thinking about just doing it traditionally, opening the patient and doing what's right for the patient, because completing this, obviously, robotically uh, has left positive margins in this patient. It's going to be something that we'll have to deal with. So when you look at patients who have positive surgical margins, albeit most of them are microscopic margins, and I'm betting that this was grossly positive, um, most patients who have microscopic positive margins after partial nephrectomies for small masses will not recur. And you're talking 90 plus percent of them will not recur. So it is safe to watch them. Uh, the first thing I would do would be to re-image the patient. Uh, as long as I don't see anything in the in the operative, on the uh, <coughs> left kidney where she was operated on, I would go ahead and complete the contralateral kidney uh, and just do a period of surveillance for this side. All right, so the patient comes four months after her left-sided surgery, no interval changes in her medical condition, CT negative, labs are within normal limits. There's your repeat imaging. Um, so just for the audience view, you can see here, here's the tumor in the right kidney still sitting there. And this is the area where the partial nephrectomy was performed. If you see that white stuff, that's contrast. That's where they injected the contrast into the vein, and it's excreted by the kidney. So she has what looks like a little bit of a urine leak in the site where the partial nephrectomy was performed, but there's no obvious tumor present. No obvious tumor. What's Dr. Karam. What's in the abdominal wall there, yes. Chris? That nodule on the left side. Oh, this? Yes. That's nothing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a port site. It's probably a port site <laughs> on the robot. Um. Yes. <laughs> so I would uh, love to see the same type of images that you have on the left, on the right side as well. So you showed the excretory, which is the late phase of the CT on the right side. But uh, it would be nice to see the same view earlier on just to see if there's any enhancing elements or 
basically to see if there's any viable tumor still left on the uh, operated side. There are, doesn't appear to be any evidence of viable tumor on the operative side. Take my word for it. So in that case, we'll just proceed with a right-sided operation. Okay, and that operation would be? A right open partial nephrectomy with ultrasound. Okay. Dr. Mateen, what are your, what are your thoughts on this? No, I agree. I, I think, um, you know, you still want to give it your all for this. Um, I have, you know, great concerns about follow-up over the next six to two years, six months to two years, and five, five years, really. But no, I think I would, I would do an open partial uh, also. I'm sure at this point she probably has no interest in anything robotic anyway. Um, but, you know, I think Delacro's, Dr. Delacro's point, you know, that it's nice to be able to do something minimally invasive, but it doesn't trump the need to do the single best cancer operation you can. So um, that that's really takes priority. So are we all in agreement that we would do a right partial nephrectomy? Yeah? Yeah. What about the left side? What would we do for that? Um, you know, so just to clarify in terms of there. positive <laughs> margins, you know, so microscopic <laughs> positive margins in kidney cancer seem to have very minimal implications. So if there's like a one millimeter positive margin, um, you know, those patients seem to do really well. The risk of recurrence uh, seems to be probably close to someone who has a negative margin. Um, now, in this case, though, there's, there, it, it's probably what we would call grossly positive margins, meaning visibly positive. And that's a totally different situation. Um, unfortunately, the truth is there's nothing we can really do. Uh, you could go back in, take out all of that tissue and not find any cancer. It does not mean that she would not have recurred. Um, you could go in, take all of that tissue, and it does not mean that she, you know, that she, that she won't recur. It sounds like I said the same thing, but actually I was trying to make a different point. <laughs> but someone with grossly positive margins really is at risk for recurrence, and I think it's like a seven-fold risk of, of them um, developing it and, and, and dying from it. So I would, I would watch her very carefully. This would not be a case where I would follow with a CT in two or three years. I would be following her much more closely. Any role for just taking out the left kidney and eliminating as a risk? Um, why don't I give one of the other guys a chance to answer that? I, I have, I mean. And not, not at this point. I mean, I would want to see what happens with the right side to make sure that the partial nephrectomy was successful with negative margins and with preserving of the right kidney. But it is worrisome that the patient has the um, unclassified type of kidney cancer. Basically, like Dr. Mati mentioned earlier, about 70 or 80 percent of the kidney cancers are clear cell, and the rest are papillary or chromophobe. Unclassified is probably less than 5 percent, and when the pathologist says it's unclassified, it means it doesn't fall into the other known categories, and these are typically uh, aggressive tumors for the most part. Okay, so the patient under. Well, under I'm sorry, Chris, but to answer your question, yeah. and I think this is one of the th things that's difficult for patients to accept is the problem with taking out, just going in and taking out everything on the left side is you don't really know what to take out. The scar tissue feels like cancer. You're not going to be able to tell by looking or feeling, and you don't really know how much spread there's been. Um, and, so, and then the other thing is you don't know if you don't want to make things worse because you don't know where things are or what, what, how to differentiate cancer from scar tissue. So the last thing you want to go in is add insult to injury by going in. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm expressing myself well. But uh, I, you and I have been there where you sense the frustration of the patient wanting to do something, and you want to too, but it, it's usually um, uh, not a good idea to do that. Any role for biopsy? Would you try maybe biopsying that left side? The sampling is going to be a problem. You don't know where to put the needle. What about targeted agents, Dr. Yeah. Muir? Any role for targeted uh, agents? No, in as study? we said earlier, on with no. All right, let's move on. It's a funny idea, you know, that, <clears throat> I mean, really what we're talking about is in terms of agents, I'm sorry, probably being a little verbose, but it's kind of interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Don't answer that. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, you would think if a, when you see a, a lesion, a metastatic lesion, you would think that if, if a drug works for that, that it should work better for when it's microscopic and you don't see it, right? I mean, you would think, but it doesn't work that way. Um, and that, because that, that's really when you're talking about additional therapy, you're talking about microscopic disease that's hibernating somewhere that we just cannot detect. I mean, that's why patients with breast cancer don't just have surgery or just don't have radiation. They have chemo, radiation, surgery, 
hormone therapy because there's my breast cancer does that. It tends to spread very easily and there's microscopic disease and for them, thankfully, there's agents that work for that. For kidney, there isn't. Why is that? Yeah. Can you give us an, a follow-up on what happened to that lady? She underwent a right partial nephrectomy. It was an unclassified tumor. Margins were negative. Kidney did fine. And then she's being observed on the left side. Okay. And Nazar, why don't you comment on why it is that maybe these targeted agents are not very effective in, or, or are, we believe they're not going to be effective in the setting of micrometastatic disease? Well, you know, because probably there is uh, the way these drugs work is uh, most of these uh, target therapies we're talking about are angiogenesis inhibitors. And it, it, it requires a metastatic phenotype with advanced, advancing progressive disease where these drugs can work. And maybe when it's still in the primary tumor, the milieu uh, uh, is such that it, it doesn't really help as much. Although we have seen, uh, you know, your, your trial, you, you will probably, I'm sure there will be some cases where you have a trial with a drug that's called excitinib that uh, you have seen, unlike we saw with the previous target agents where we didn't really see significant tumor shrinkage of primary tumors in the kidneys with this uh, second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor, as we call them now, uh, you have seen more than you would have expected uh, with significant shrinkage in maybe two-thirds or three-quarters of the patients. So I think it's, uh, the jury is still out. I don't think we can say that these drugs don't work in the adjuvant setting. Uh, the trials are out, and uh, we will have the results in the next two or three years, at least with the first trial, the largest trial, the Ashur trial. We will see if uh, these drugs do have value in uh, the earlier stage disease than in the advanced stage disease. But, you know, this concept of drugs working in the metastatic setting, not working in the earlier stage setting, is not just uh, in kidney cancer. In prostate cancer, for example, uh, chemotherapy uh, works very well for patients with advanced uh, castration-resistant prostate cancer, but when you give them early on, when the patient still has disease in the prostate, they don't work. Uh, uh, so, so that is a concept that is... Uh, not just for kidney cancer, for, for many genitourinary cancers. And I think the point needs to be made that, you know, the, the, these drugs target the vasculature. They're not anti-tumoral. They don't attack the cancer cell. They attack the blood vessel that supports the cancer cell. And in the setting of micrometastatic disease, do we even know if these cancer cells have a vasculature? So it may not have any impact on, on them at all.